popular, had some nice uh, feedback from people saying, I can't have beehives uh, either from uh, zoning, or, zoning uh, regulations or uh, maybe some physical limitations or some people are, are just quite considerate of their neighbors. They maybe have a, a child or a child, someone in the neighborhood who's allergic to bees and they will not risk having a hive around. And that's you know just the right thing to do. No need to take that chance. But what they can do is uh, plant a few plants for the pollinators, not just the honeybees, the, the bumblebees, the native bees, the moths, the butterflies, the even the bats need some, some nectar from the flowers. So uh, what we're wanting to do here is, is give people some means to select some plants and see them in location growing. This Heliopsis is a false sunflower, perennial, and it also self-seeds very well. Uh, but it has a wide range of pollinators. Right now there's a a couple of beetles on it. There's a little helicted native bee, sometimes called the sweat bee, that's working it pretty hard. Uh, great pollinator plant in, in general. They're hardy, they're drought tolerant. Uh, I recommend them. Back here is that uh, white melolotus cultivar hubam. Uh, blooms later, extends the clover season, and uh, gives nice honey. You, you can see different plants in there, are different uh, pollinators in there now. What I learned this year, one of the most prolific pollinators is the lightning bug. They are working day and night, or they're working in the day and in the night, the, the lightning bug display. We've got free fireworks all summer sort of down into the west of that hubam. It was a bed of all snapdragons. It's sort of done its primary bloom. I have deadheaded it and there'll be a, another batch of, of blooms. The honeybees can get in that snapdragon blossom. They just disappear in there, <laughs> kind of force their way in. The bumblebee is heavy enough that it, it lands on that bottom lip and sort of weights it down and it just has to put its thorax in there and it can reach the nectar. So it's a little bit easier for them or at least they don't disappear. This bed was sort of a, a left a combination or from last spring my friend Dan gave me some different plants. There was this lily that's already gone by. There was a two or three of these uh, Shasta daisies I'm calling them. The Heliopsis there's a Rudbeckia that will be a good fall plant bloomer. And there's, seems like one more thing. But I didn't realize how prolifically they self-seed. I could have put the two or three plants of each that I had in a five by, five by seven bed of its own and it would have seeded it for this year. There are, are seedlings all over here to share or to spread around. Here is, is that uh, catnip, and there's a little bit of uh, agastache in there, which is Anis hyssop, another very popular bee plant, and I like to go and rub it. Anise is what flavors licorice, and uh, you get that smell anytime you want to get a sample of it. This sunflowers were filling out this Heliopsis bed last year just because there was room. They uh, self-seeded this bed over here and I let some volunteers go and this one's probably going to be the champion sunflower in the garden this summer. I did plant a row from seed on the south side there but uh, this one's husky. There is a uh, Asclepius here, milkweed, the uh, orange one, tuberosus and which was purposely planted last year, another for, gift from Dan. This is the common milkweed, the preferred uh, site for monarch butterflies to come by, lay their eggs and, and move on on the migration or sometimes those eggs hatch and continue on the migration. Such a, such a mystery that one, the, the butterflies that start the migration don't complete it. 
back to the, the milkweed. I wish we had smell vision because this is just really nice, kind of a cross between uh, lilacs. Uh, and then when that first starts to bloom and you come out in the, on a still morning, it permeates the whole garden. These are, are probably fertilized, starting to, to fade. These are still fragrant and, and attracting the insects and, and really a, a cute little blossom. You can see an ant on there getting a little, a couple ants getting a little nectar right now. And those that the pollinators have done their job, they make these little uh, kind of prickly pods that'll get long and, and have those uh, aerial seeds that float in the wind. And one of the varieties of milkweeds, someone is taking that silky uh, parachute, so to speak, and make, making a very good insulation product with it. There's another volunteer common. And I, I let them come up. They're not without their problems. I had one over in the strawberry patch and it succumbed to something. So it's, it's not all roses for, or as James Taylor saying, it's, it ain't always easy for a weed to grow. I, I wetted my uh, bee garden with the gardener's kitchen garden. This is Menarda, and it's, there are numerous species of Menarda. Again, very fragrant. Oil of bergamot comes from here. If you're an Earl Grey tea drinker, that is the main flavoring ingredient of, of Earl Grey tea. Captain Picard would be proud of you. I read in one of the companion type planting books that tomatoes really love Menarda, that they really benefit each other. So here's a caged uh, cherry tomato. There's a tomato called Amish paste that I'm trying new this year. I, I bet it's close to my Aunt Esther's Mennonite uh, paste tomato. It's indeterminate, so you, you get the crop trickling along instead of most of the romas and things were bred to be determinate mature the vines to a certain length and then they put their energy into ripening the fruit all at once. And it's, it's great for people making tomato sauce or in the commercial business. Now the, the downside of this Menarda didyma, it's that red I told you about. Uh, not as attractive. There's some lavender and some white versions, different uh, species within the genus. But I like it. I like the, the scent of it. I like how hardy it is. This, again, was a, there was numerous plants from Dan, and I spread it out in its five by seven bed, and it filled it in completely with, with underground runners, and now it's a patch. There's a, a real tendency, it's probably uh, archetypal, for people to collect and, and sort of have, I want a, a plant of everything, especially when you're new to a, a hobby. And gardening is, is no different, but Jim Crockett said it so well. He says, if you do that too much, your garden ends up looking like clown's, clown's pants. <laughs> and uh, another person in that school is Kim Todd, the lecturer at UNL. She says, when you have big patches, you want broad brush strokes. Don't plant a plant plant a flat of them, plant a bed. And, and that's also much better for the bees. They go back to the hive and they, they code the direction, the distance, and the bees can tell by the scent of, of that bee coming in what they're looking for. But uh, a bigger patch gives, bees are somewhat true to the, the flower that they start pollinating. It's called flower fidelity in the bee world and it's good for the plants in that they don't get cross-pollinized so much. They want out pollination but uh, some species are close enough related to other things within the genus that they will cross and they maybe don't want to do that. So it's, uh, and I, I just read uh, Tom Seeley's latest book and his research he noticed that bees that are once uh, imprinted to a flower and you make that inaccessible or take a food source away, they will kind of hang around the hive waiting for 
the dance for that particular honey to nectar to come around again and then they'll go out and collect again. Here's another plant in the Malva family. This one has been on this place for years. I got it from a garden club member. There used to be a county garden club uh, co-ed through the extension here back way back in the 80s. I'm showing my age. But uh, when, when they sent this, when they shared this at plant share meeting, they warned us. They says, you plant this, you'll never have to plant it again. It's each of these flowers makes uh, what the old timers, excuse me, <laughs> used to call a cheese wheel because that's, that's what the, the uh, little flower or seed packet looks like. Each of those little wheels there has about eight seeds into it, in it. Look how many there are on there. Uh, I have to weed these out all over the garden and, and hold it to this one bed here. The pretty part of this flower, and I saw an electron micrograph of the color of this shifted into UV. The bee just sees a real road map that directs it right to the pollen source. And when the bees are, are pollinating this, their whole hairy body is colored that light purple and their little pollen baskets are packed full of it. It's a good nectar and pollen producer. Some plants do one and not the other, but some do both. Just started this week is this pretty blue morning glory, Ipomea. And they are also quite uh, <laughs> imperialist. They will go everywhere. I carried, just carried some plants to the chipper shredder and I spread these seeds all around the garden. And you never have to plant them again. They will come up close enough to any spots you want them to be and decide to let them grow. My uh, designated spot this year is on a, one of these fence panels. But uh, I like them. The bees do too. This was a uh, all yellow uh, honey or sweet clover. It's gone by. I can send some seed home with you today, Larry, if you want. It's mature enough. Back here, just blooming a light lavender is that uh, Agastache or Anis hyssop. There's a whole bed of that there. Hidden in here straight neck yellow squash. I like to hide them amongst other plants because it's harder for the cucumber beetle which is also known as the uh, corn borer beetle in this area and that there's no shortage because this is corn country. They don't hurt the plant so much but they're, any little uh, bite that they take seems to be entry for wilt. So uh, that's why I like to hide one plant amongst plants versus having a big planting of, of uh, squash. It's just that much easier. Plants, our insects seem to hone in on, uh, I don't know if it's pheromones or uh, just the color uh, wavelength of the flower, but it's tougher for them to find it when you got singles. I have one here and one in four other places stagger planted. It's a great day and a great timing as far as season goes, but if we were here just 48 hours from now, I got this surprise uh, rebloom of an amaryllis bulb here that it's going to be spectacular. Would I, if you get amaryllis in the Chris, at Christmas time when they're marketed very heavily, uh, don't throw them away. Kind of keep them green, limp them along till spring, and then plant them out and, and treat them like gladioli. With just, uh, my mother's in the retirement home, but, but my step nephew has sent her a blooming, or an amaryllis soon to bloom for Christmas for over a decade. 
and instead of throw them out, we nurse them through to the summertime, plant them out in the garden. They uh, rejuvenate, they send up a new batch of leaves. The bulb gets bigger. As the bulb gets big enough, it, it sends off an offshoot, so it multiplies that way. Uh, then in the fall, the decreasing day length signals them to shut down. They yellow, and it's best to probably dig them before the first frost. Store them in tubs, baskets. Uh, I use I just fill up the gaps with a peat moss vermiculite mixture and try to keep them at about 50, 55 degrees, and start all over in the spring. Now this one is out of sync because we had a crazy spring last year. I only got about that many planted out and, and all of these languished in the kind of cool storage for the summer. When I dug these for the, for the fall, I went and found these still in the tub. They had aborted their blossoms, of course, but they were still firm and showing some life. So I potted them up for the winter and brought them out this spring. And this one has enough energy for a blossom yet this, this summer. That's just a freebie. This is also sort of a, a summering place for indoor plants. I, I cut back, I brought out the snake plant or mother-in-law's tongue, Sansevieria. It was busting the pot. I, I got it out of there and, and split them up, repotted and some in pots and some to have a summer vacation out here in the garden. Here is a, an orphan a colocasia, elephant ear. Uh, People will plant, buy those in the spring and just grow them as an annual for the summer and let them go. Uh, I brought it in and stored it with the amaryllis bulbs, kind of a natural uh, summering place. And it came back alive this spring. I got it a little late, but it, it did survive. I like this little plant called Alternanthera. Some, it's one of many plants called Joseph's Coat. But in Victorian gardens, they used to multiply that like crazy and, and make their uh, knot gardens, just rows of that. And you could trim it to size. It's in, there's a very dark purple one that I'm down to my last uh, McCoy, so I better do some better propagation and preservation of that. There's some curl varieties that are very red. There's some very yellow, some all yellow that don't have a curl leaf. but. And there's been some attempts for some new varieties of that alternanthera, one called Party Time, which did not impress me. This castor bean is an eye catcher. If people see me in the garden and they've noticed this, they'll stop and say, ask, where can I get seeds? And I'll say, right here. Um, it's this rich burgundy color. It's, it's really catching. This is the, uh, the flower. And... Uh, the castor bean is where castor oil comes from. Some of the older folks will remember maybe having a daily dose as a uh, uh, kind of setting the system right. But this, where these are grown commercially for castor oil production, that is a, a fine honey. There, you've heard of varietal wines. Well, there are varietal honeys, and this makes a very good honey. Now, as, as useful as the castor oil is, after they press that bean, the uh, leftover pomace, I guess you could call it, is what is called ricin. That is the nasty poison that there was a scare after 9-11. It is toxic. So if, if you've got children in your house or children in your neighborhood, you maybe want to let this bloom and then cut it off because the next stage are these pods. Again, a pretty color to them those soft spines get quite rigid and hard and, and irritating later and people can develop kind of allergic re reaction to that stuff um, just harvesting the seeds and collect them. Each of those seeds resembles a uh, swollen engorged uh, tick especially the uh, dermacenter tick, the Rocky Mountain tick um, there's, there's three per pod. I, w I will collect them, but 
when, the, when winters are mild or there's snow cover, as there was last year, these seeds will fall to the ground and survive and, and self-seed. That's why there's some sprinkled around the garden. I have a tough time pulling them up. And a, a senior lady was by last week and said, I used to raise those. And she says, can I get some seed? And I said, we'll do one better. We dug up some plants and she's got them going already. She's a good gardener. Um, I would like to be Uncle Sam in the suit saying, I want you to garden for the bees if you can't have the bees yourself. If you can't garden for the bees, be an activist. Uh, write or call the EPA or your senator and say, why are we putting these, uh, approving these chemicals that are toxic, not just to bees, but as Hank Tenneke says in, in the Netherlands, a tech toxicologist, they're destroying the whole web of life. We can't continue this way.